Brethren, in many of the world's churches today, ministers have preached a message that God only wants good things in your life. And God wants to shower you with physical blessings. These ministers say that if you are not receiving these blessings in your life, that, that means that you just don't have enough faith, or that you must have done something wrong, or that somehow you are not pleasing God. This message is known as the health and wealth gospel, which has been popularized today in today's narcissistic, shallow, and unrighteous society. This health and wealth gospel basically not only equates physical blessings with pleasing God, but it also adopts a direct correlation and link between the amount of physical blessings that you're receiving and the amount that you are pleasing God. They go hand in hand. So if you are rich, healthy, successful, and happy, it's because you are pleasing God. And conversely, if you are poor, sick, unsuccessful, and unhappy, it is because you are not pleasing God. You're doing something wrong. You have sinned some secret sin in your life, and God is punishing you. Something is amiss. Something is wrong with you. Please turn with me to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. And we will read the first verse. You know, here Job was smitten with horrible boils all over his body. He experienced such terrible pain and suffering. We read in Job 1 and in the first verse. Job chapter 1 and verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one who feared God and eschewed evil. We continue the story in Job 2 and verse 7. Job chapter 2 and verse 7. So when Satan is actually in Hebrew, Hasatan, which simply means the adversary, it's not his name. His name is not Satan. His, it's his title in Hebrew. He's the adversary. So the adversary came forth from the, pre, to, from the presence of Yehovah and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. He was in agony because he now had sore boils all over his body. So in Job's horrible sickness and in his terrible agony, his three friends came to console him. But they, as they continued to talk, each of his friends came to the same conclusion. Job must have sinned a great sin, and he is being punished by God. This is a punishment from God. Job's three friends were wrong about the source of Job's sufferings. Eliphaz the Temanite told Job that the innocent are not pu punished. And we read this in Job chapter 4 and verse 7. Job chapter 4 and verse 7. In Job chapter 4 verse 7, Eliphaz says, Remember, I pray you, whoever perished being innocent. And where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. So Job, you must have done something right, wrong. Bildad the Shuhai told Job that God makes righteous people prosperous in all that they do. We read this in Job 8, in verse 3. Job chapter 8 in verse 3. In Job 8, verse 3, we read, Does God pervert judgment, or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your children have sinned against Him, and He, have cast, and he has cast them away for their transgression, if you would, would seek unto God betimes, and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, if you were pure and upright, surely now He would awake for you and make the habitation of your righteousness prosperous. 
Zophar the Namanite told Job that he must have sinned to be punished like this and that he should stop doing whatever sin that he had committed. We read this in Job 11 and verse 13. Job chapter 11 and verse 13. In Job 11, 13, we read, If you prepare your heart and stretch out your hands toward him, if iniquity be in your hand, put it far away and let not wickedness dwell in your tabernacles. For then shall you lift up your face without spot. Yea, you shall be steadfast and shall not fear. Now, we'll discuss later in the sermon why Job's three friends were completely wrong in their judgment of the source of Job's horrible predicament. But that belief of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, Job's three friends, constitutes a core belief in many Christian belief today. If you obey God and please Him, you will always prosper. You will always prosper and be blessed physically. And if you don't obey God and don't please Him, you will never prosper. You will never prosper and never be wealthy and healthy. But this belief simply is not true. Please turn with me to Psalm 73. Psalm 73, where Asaph saw and was even envious of the prosperity of the wicked. Psalm 73, and I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. Psalm Chapter, uh, psalm number 73, beginning in verse 1. A psalm of Asaph, Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I almost, uh, was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. So the wicked and the unrighteous can be prosperous in this life. Can the opposite be true? Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. You know, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount spoke about this seeming paradox to the multitude which had gathered around him. We read this in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 44. Matthew 5, verse 44 Jesus said, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them who hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he makes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So our Heavenly Father sends the same Son each day on the the righteous and on the unrighteous. It shines every day on both. And he sends the rain on the unrighteous and on the righteous alike. Both the righteous and the unrighteous benefit and are blessed with the love of our Heavenly Father. Please turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 where we will read a very important and crucial concept, principle, and truth. We read this in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, beginning in verse 14. I'll read this out of the New Century Bible. Ecclesiastes 8, beginning in verse 14. Sometimes something useless happens on earth. Bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. I say this is also, that this is also useless, so I decided it was more important to enjoy life. The best that people can do here on earth is to eat, drink, and enjoy life, because these joys will help them do the hard work God gives them here on earth. So brethren, in my sermon this afternoon entitled, why do bad things happen to good people? Just as we read in Ecclesiastes 8. Why do bad things happen to good people? I'd like to explore the subject of bad things which continue to happen to the called out ones 
of our Heavenly Father, even though that they are being obedient to Him. And I'd like to explore this subject in four points this afternoon. The first point concerning why bad things happen to good people is, we as called out ones do not live charmed lives. Point number one is we as called out ones do not live charmed lives. Please turn with me to Ecclesiastes 9, just one page over. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. It is a biblical principle that time and chance happen to us all. And we read this in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, beginning in verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. In Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, we read, Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you go. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happens to them all. For man also knows not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falls suddenly upon them. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 13, and we'll read about a tragedy that killed 18 people. 18 people who were living and suddenly were dead. This tragedy in the town of Siloam was a major news event that had a lasting effect upon the people in the region. Jesus referred to this tragedy to make a point. We read this in Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering unto them said, Suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then in verse 4, Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, and slew them, do you think that they were sinners above all men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except you repent you shall all likewise perish. So the, the falling of the tower in Siloam was apparently an accident. It was not planned. We don't know why it fell. We're just not told. But when it fell, it killed 18 people who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Time and chance happened to them. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and we will explore one of the temptations of Jesus the Anointed One by our adversary, the devil. We read this in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 5. In Matthew 4 and verse 5, we read, Then the devil takes him up into the holy city. He's taking Jesus up into the holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If you be the Son of God, here it's Hotheos, the God, God our Father. Again, the God of the Jews was Yehovah. So the devil was saying, If you be the Son of Yehovah, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Now, please turn with me to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. The devil was quoting scripture, twisting scripture, but he was quoting scripture from Psalm 91. And we'll read this. Psalm chapter 91, beginning in verse 1. Psalm 91 in verse 1. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of Jehovah, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. 
Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, or for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh to you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made Jehovah, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation. There shall no evil befall you, either shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. He, they shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and dragon shall you trample under feet. Because you have set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him, and I will set him on high, because you have known my name. So what was Jesus' response to the devil's temptation? Let's read it in Matthew 4 and verse 7. Matthew 4 and verse 7. In verse 7 of Matthew 4 we read, Jesus said unto him, It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Because the devil used this psalm in tempting Jesus, many believe that Psalm 91 was a prophecy about Jesus. But as we read Psalm 91, we can glean that the psalm is concerning all of those who put their trust in our Heavenly Father. In fact, the devil was not tempting Jesus to stub his toe. Rather, he was tempting Jesus to fall from the pinnacle of the temple, which would have killed Jesus. It was a far distance. It was probably well over 50 to 60 feet. He was tempting Jesus to fall from the tem t temple, tip the pinnacle of the temple, which would kill him, and thwart the plan of salvation for all of mankind. In order to prevent Jesus' premature death, our Heavenly Father would have had to have intervened and to save him from death, from a certain death, through his angels. And as Jesus rightly quoted in his counter to the devil, that would have been deliberately putting our Heavenly Father to the test in a very frivolous and cavalier way, which in itself is sin. Although Jesus knew that he would have divine protection, he did not use that knowledge to put himself in dangerous situations or to act carelessly and frivolously and cavalierly in ways that would endanger his life and his health. You know, brethren, we as called out ones should live the same way as Jesus did. We are living our lives in order to draw closer and closer to our Heavenly Father. That in no way, that in no means... That in no way means that we will not experience pain or suffering or hardship in our lives. We simply do not live charmed lives. Now the second point concerning why bad things happen to good people is, point number two, we as called out ones are not promised health and wealth. Point number two, we as called out ones are not promised health and wealth. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 28. You know, pe many people turn to Deuteronomy 28 as proof of the promise of the health and wealth gospel. This chapter is the well-known agreement of blessings for obedience and cursings for disobedience between Yehovah and the children of Israel before they entered the promised land. And we read this in Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of Jehovah your God, to observe and to do all of his commandments which I command you this day, that Jehovah your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you, if you shall hearken unto the voice of Jehovah your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be 
shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your kind and the flocks of your sheep. Blessed be your, shall be your basket and your store. Blessed shall, be, shall, shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. Yehovah shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Yehovah shall command the blessing upon you in your storehouses and in all that you set your hand unto, and he shall bless you in the land in which Yehovah your God gives you. Yehovah shall establish you and a, a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto you, if you keep the commandments of Yehovah your God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of Yehovah, and they shall be afraid of you. And Yehovah shall make you plenteous in goods, in the fruit of your body, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of the ground and the land which Yehovah swore unto your fathers to give you. And Yehovah shall open unto you his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto you in his land, and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend unto many nations, and you shall not borrow. And Yehovah shall make you the head and not the tail. And you shall be above only, and you shall not be beneath. And if you hearken unto the commandments of Yehovah your God, which I command you this day to observe and to do them. Wonderful blessings. Wonderful blessings promised for Israel. But brethren, a key aspect to realize here is that the health and wealth were the blessings for obedience under the covenant with Israel. Commonly referred to as the Old Covenant. The covenant with, uh, with Israel was, a f was physical in nature, not spiritual. This covenant has physical blessings for obedience and physical curses for disobedience. When Israel and Judah obeyed Yehovah, they had rain in due season, bountiful harvest, protection from their enemies, and peace in their land. They were totally prosperous. Israel was rewarded and was blessed for their obedience with prosperity and security. Brethren, these blessings were a part of the covenant with Israel. They are not a direct blessing and promise of our Heavenly Father in the everlasting covenant, commonly referred to as the new covenant. The spiritual covenant that we have with our Heavenly Father, which brings spiritual salvation. The blessings in Deuteronomy 28 are not part of our covenant with our Heavenly Father as His called out ones. It's just not part of the covenant. Nowhere in the New Testament are, are our Heavenly Father's called out ones promised an easy life, a life filled with wealth and health and prosperity. This is a key point. We are not promised health and wealth in this life. Our reward is not of this earth. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll read a small portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We read this in Matthew 5 and verse 11. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11. Jesus said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Our reward, brethren, is in heaven and is not on this earth, in this physical life. Please turn with me to Matthew 16. Jesus proclaimed that our reward will come at his return. This is completely different. This is a completely different reward from that spelled out in Deuteronomy 28. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. Matthew 16 and verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. 
For what is a for what is a man profited if he shall give or gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And in verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Our reward comes at the resurrection and at his return. Please turn with me to Matthew 6. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus discussed our future spiritual reward in contrast to any current physical reward. We read this in Matthew 6 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. Jesus said, Take heed that you do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when you do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. That's their reward in this lifetime. But when you do alms, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your alms may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret himself shall reward you openly. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites are, for they love to sta pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Everyone thinks they're pious. That's their reward in this life. But when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret, will reward you openly. Skipping down to verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, don't be as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Their reward is now in this physical life when people think they're so pious because they're fasting. And verse 17, But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that you appear not unto men to fast, but unto your Father which is in, who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. Brethren, again and again and again, Jesus announced that our reward is a future reward in heaven. And that our reward is not in this physical life. However, living our Heavenly Father's way of life and obeying His laws do bring blessings to our lives. I'm not discounting that the Father does bless us for obeying Him. But we live in an evil world ruled over by the evil one, the devil, our adversary, and his demons. And consequently, we are not promised and we are not assured health, wealth, and prosperity in this physical life due solely to our obedience to our Heavenly Father and His laws. The third point concerning why bad things happen to good people is, point number three, we as called out ones are promised hardship and persecution. We as called out ones are promised hardship and persecution. You know, our adversary, the devil, is after all of us. He wants us to be frustrated. He wants us to be disappointed, to be depressed, to be weary with our lives. He wants us to give up. He wants to destroy us. He hates us with a passion. He is definitely not our friend. He wants more than anything else for us to fail. Because if we fail, it thwarts the plan of salvation of our Heavenly Father. Please turn with me to 1 Peter 5. And we will read a warning from the Apostle Peter. Very, very well-known verse. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. This is who we are up against. This is our adversary. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, he is our adversary. The devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. You know, our adversary, the devil, is constantly and continuously attempting to thwart 
our Heavenly Father's plan of salvation. He wants to devour us all, and He has attempted to do that throughout man's history on this earth. Please turn with me back to Job 1, where we started in the sermon. Job was a righteous man. He lived a righteous life, and he feared God and hated evil. This is the type of man that Job was. And we read again in Job 1, in verse 1. Job chapter 1, in verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one who feared God and eschewed evil. Skipping down to verse 6. Now there was a day when the son, sons of God came to present themselves before Jehovah, and the adversary came also among them. And Jehovah said unto the adversary, Which, Where do you come from? And the adversary answered Jehovah and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And Jehovah said unto the adversary, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one who fears God and eschews evil? Again, this was a person who was living a righteous life. And the Father even says that. Jehovah says that he was telling the adversary that he is a perfect and upright man and he fears me. In the story of Job, our Heavenly Father allows the adversary to take away all of Job's wealth, his sons and his daughters, all of his possessions, and ultimately... The adversary was allowed to take away his health. He was smitten with painful boils from head to foot. This was a test for Job designed by, specifically by our Heavenly Father to further refine him and to bring a deeper understanding and relationship with God our Father. And in the end, everything and more was restored back to Job. And for a period of time, which probably felt like an eternity to Job, Job suffered immensely, even though God our Father said that he was righteous. He suffered even though he was righteous. Please turn with me to Luke 12, where after talking to the multitude, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he proclaimed to them that he was not sending peace on the earth for his followers, the called out ones of his heavenly Father. We read this in Luke 12, beginning in verse 49. Luke chapter 12, and we'll begin in verse 49. Jesus said, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if, I if it already be kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose you that I come to give peace on earth, I tell you, nay, rather, division. From, for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Brethren, how many of us today are at odds with our own families and our own friends because of our devotion to our Heavenly Father, and to His Son, Jesus. Please turn with me to Hebrews 11. Very familiar scriptures. Hebrews chapter 11. Brethren, our pre predecessors in the faith had very different lives from what we have had in the faith. In Hebrews 11, we are told about the life of suffering that many saints had to endure in the past. And we read this in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in, th in the middle of verse 35. Hebrews 11 and verse 35. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may, might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, 
were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. These faithful predecessors in the faith, our predecessors in the faith, did not enjoy health, wealth, and prosperity in their lives. On the contrary, they lived lives of hardship and destitution and deprivation. The Apostle Paul endured numerous, numerous severe trials and afflictions in his life. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11. And we will read about his trials and afflictions. It's incredible what Paul endured. We read about this in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-three, Paul wrote, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times I received forty stripes except one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, and in the journeys in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which come upon me daily, the care of all the churches. In spite of all these sufferings, deprivations, and afflictions, the Apostle Paul was still content. However, Paul apparently had a severe trial of a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was exactly, or who it was. The Bible does not tell us. But Paul really desired for this to be alleviated from his life, this affliction to be lifted. And we read about this in 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, Paul wrote, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of the adversary, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above, above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will I rather glory in my infirmities that, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, God our Father did not take away the thorn in the flesh from Paul. Instead, Paul was told that he should be content, and the grace of his heavenly Father was enough. Do we feel that way when we are having difficulties? When the answer sometimes is no. Or at least, not now. Please turn with me to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul also wrote that we all will suffer. Romans chapter 8. And we'll begin in verse 16. Romans chapter 8. In verse 16, Paul wrote, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and have children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote that we, as the called out ones of our Heavenly Father and joint heirs with Jesus of the kingdom, we suffer with Him so that we will be glorified together. Please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. The Apostle Peter wrote about the enduring fiery trials 
that we encounter in our lives that we should not be surprised that we have these fiery trials. He wrote about this in 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 12. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know, are we surprised that we're having difficulties, that we're having trials, that we're having problems with, with life in general, that things just keep happening out of nowhere, that affect us. In verse 13, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy you are, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So don't be surprised when bad things happen, because they will. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul wrote that we will live troubled and perplexing lives, but that our Heavenly Father will make us strong through those difficulties. In 2 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 7, 2 Corinthians 4 in verse 7, Paul writes, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God. That's Hotheos, the God, God our Father. And not of us. It's His power. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Our Heavenly Father gives us the power and the might to endure. Please turn with me to John chapter 16. On the last night of his physical life, Jesus told his disciples that they would experience many trials and sorrows in their lives. We read this in John chapter 16 and verse 32. I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. John chapter 16 and verse 32. In John chapter 16, and verse 32, Jesus said, But the time is coming, and indeed it's here now, when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. In this life, it's a promise. <laughs> it's what Jesus told us. We will have many trials and sorrows on this earth. Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Many members of the early church were imprisoned and suffered greatly. We read about this in Hebrews chapter 13, begin, beginning in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1. In Hebrews 13 verse 1 we read, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And in verse 3, Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which, who suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord, that's kurios without the, the, the definite article, the. And in the Septuagint Greek, that is Yehovah. That's God our Father. So that we may boldly say, 
Our Heavenly Father is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Although the called out ones have always endured suffering and hardship, our Heavenly Father is our helper, and He calms our fears by our trust in Him. Brethren, neither our Heavenly Father nor Jesus have promised us an easy life. You know, instead, Jesus and the apostles preached that we should live lives of suffering and that we would live lives of suffering and deprivation. We as called out ones are promised hardship and persecution in this life. The fourth point concerning why bad things happen to good people is point number four. We as called out ones are purified by fire. We as called out ones are purified by fire. Please turn with me to Malachi 3. Malachi chapter 3. And we will read about our Heavenly Father and how He is like a silversmith purifying His silver. And Malachi 3, beginning in verse 3. And He, talking about Yehovah, shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto Yehovah an offering in righteousness. From an article by Patricia Holbrook entitled, Making Silver, A Reflection on the Heat of Our Trials, appearing in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, she writes, quote, One of the earliest methods of refining silver is called cupellation, and it involves heating crude silver at extremely high temperature until it is liquefied, and adding certain substances such as nitric acid to help absorb the impurities. Once the pollutants are consumed and the temperature is just right, the liquefied silvers should become as clear as a mirror. And according to tradition, when the silversmith can see his or her reflection in the metal, it is ready to pour. It's been purified. Both the temperature and the moment to take the metal out of the fire must be precise, or it could destroy the silver. For that reason, the craftsman must sit and carefully manage the process tempering the metal until it's ready, controlling the heat and timing, unquote. You know, brethren, the process of refining and purifying silver by a silversmith required that the silversmith pay, pay close attention and remain totally focused on the silver in the fire as it's heated up. Once the process has started, the silversmith does not leave the silver in the fire for any reason. He continues to sit by the fire. He's always there looking and observing the silver as it is being purified in the high heat of the fire. The silversmith never leaves because if the silver were unattended even for a little while, the silver could become too hot, resulting in an irreparable damage to the silver itself. And the silversmith knows that the purification process is complete when he can see his own face reflecting back to him in the silver. You know, brethren, just like a silversmith, our Heavenly Father never leaves us. Not for a moment. Not for a second. He is always there as our silversmith purifying us until he can see his own reflection in us reflecting back to him. Please turn with me to John chapter 15, and we'll read about God our Father purging those who he loves in order to make them more fruitful. Jesus talked to his disciples about that purging on the last night of his physical life. In John 15, in verse 1, John chapter 15 and verse 1. In John 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, the Greek verb for purge in verse 2 is kathairo. It's K-A-T-H-A-I-R-O. 
Kathayiro, and it's Strong's number 2508. And it means to cleanse, to prune, and to purify and make clean by removing impurities and undesirable elements. We obtain our English words cathartic and catharsis from this Greek verb. You know, by cleaning it, this cleaning by removing undesirable and impure elements is exactly what the silversmith does when he is purifying his silver. But why is God, our Father, purifying us and pruning us? We read this answer in verse 8 of John 15. In John 15 and verse 8, we read, Here in it, in is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you shall be my disciples. Brethren, our Heavenly Father purifies us so that we bear much fruit, so that He Himself is glorified, because we reflect Him in our lives. People will see that fruit and will glorify Him. Please turn with me to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Our Heavenly Father allows severe trials, severe trials in our lives, even though that we are obeying Him. Because these trials build character within us. The character that our Heavenly Father wants in His children so that they can enter into His kingdom. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. 1 Peter 1 and verse 6 we read, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's when we receive our reward. Our Heavenly Father views our fiery trials and tests in this life as being very precious to Him because He sees the big picture. He knows that the heat from those fiery trials and tests will further refine us and further draw us closer and closer to being like Him so that we will be part of the resurrection of the first fruits, and we will enter into His spiritual kingdom. Please turn with me to Revelation 3. There seems to be no other way to be refined and to be shaped into our Heavenly Father's image without heat and without fire. The members in Laodicea were not wholeheartedly, humbly, and diligently following Jesus' example and our Heavenly Father's desire for us to be like Him. And we read this in Revelation 3 and verse 14. Again, very familiar and well-known scriptures. Revelation chapter 3 and in verse 14. Revelation 3 and four, verse 14, we read, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because of your, you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing." And don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich and white, and clothed in white, white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As, I, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You know, brethren, just like fire and heat remove impurities from silver and from gold and other metals, fire and heat, through trials and sufferings, remove spiritual impurities from our spiritual lives so that our Heavenly Father can see Himself when He sees us. 
That's the goal. When he sees us, he sees himself reflecting back to him. Brethren, in today's message, we have explored in four points why bad events happen, why bad circumstances and undesired and disappointing outcomes, sickness, financial hardship, and suffering, why they are all part of the lives of the called out ones of our Heavenly Father. Many of our unfortunate and difficult circumstances are the direct result of our own bad decisions and actions. But brother, many times suffering and hardship come seemingly out of nowhere when we're trying to do good, when we are being obedient to his laws, when we are showing love to others, when we are trying our best to live his way of life. Bad things still happen. And as we have explored today, there are reasons for that which are spiritual in nature. We have explored four points, and those points are, point number one, we, are called, we as called out ones do not live charmed lives. You know, there's a belief in many in the past that since we are called by God our Father, since we are so special to Him, and since He loves us so much that somehow we live charmed lives. And bad things will not happen to us. This is just not true. Even Jesus himself did not live a charmed life. At the end of his physical life, he was tortured. He was whipped beyond recognition. He had parts of his body whipped out from his body, where his bones even showed. He was brutally and painfully crucified on the cross. That's not living a charmed life. Why would we ever believe that we would live charmed lives? Point number two, we as called out ones are not promised health and wealth. It's just not true that the called out ones of our Heavenly Father are promised health and wealth in this present life. Our reward is not in this life. Our reward is in the future. That's the agreement in the new covenant. Our reward is being brought to us at our resurrection to physical life in the future. In the perspective of trillions and trillions and trillions of years, an eternity in the future, this present life of ours of roughly 80 years or so, are just a blip in the timeline of eternity. God our Father and Jesus our brother want us to be happy, vibrant, tireless, and joyous. But they want that for us for all of eternity into the future. Point number three, we as called out ones are promised hardship and persecution. You know, again, as called out ones of our Heavenly Father, as followers of the spiritual covenant which gives spiritual salvation, we are promised hardship, suffering, deprivation, and persecution. God our Father wants His called out ones to be in a spiritual kingdom as His children forever. That's His greatest desire. And He allows us to undergo hardship and persecution to mold and to shape us more and more like Him and his son. And point number four, we as called out ones are purified by fire. Just like a master silversmith, God our Father is refining us with fire and with high heat to remove the spiritual impurities within us so that when he sees us, he sees himself reflecting back to him. And in this refining process, we learn ever more deeply to love Him, to trust Him, to follow Him, to please Him, and to obey Him in all things. Brethren, are you suffering? Are you in pain? Are you sick? Are you not prosperous in what you are doing? Are you tired and fatigued? Are you bewildered by trying your best to live righteously, but circumstances keep happening that keep you 
from succeeding with your goals and hopes and dreams? Do we wonder at times, why are all these bad things happening to me when I am trying to do good in my life? Do we ever ask our Heavenly Father, what in the world is going on here? Why is all of this happening to me? Do we find ourselves like Tevye in the Fiddler on the Roof, who, when he was talking to God and all of his tr trials and tribulations, said, I know that we are the chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose someone else? Do we ever feel that way? Again, God our Father does not promise us health and wealth in this life. These are blessings. There are blessings, many blessings for following his laws and precepts. But there are evil forces in this world which also affect our lives. And our Heavenly Father allows that. The lives of our predecessors in the faith were full of suffering, deprivation, and hardship. All the while, they were trying to live righteous lives and trying to please our Heavenly Father. Does it come as a surprise then that we as descendants in the faith of those people would also live lives full of suffering, deprivation, and hardship? So brethren, why do bad things happen to good people? Because our Heavenly Father in His infinite and wisdom and infinite love uses these bad events and circumstances in our lives to refine us, to purify us, to humble us, and to mold us more and more into His image. Until that special day when we will be resurrected to spiritual life and will be presented by Jesus to our Heavenly Father where we will live forever with Him. I end my message with my favorite verse in the Bible which summarizes this message. Please turn with me to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. And we will read a very special promise that has been made to the called out ones. And in this verse, the word for God in Greek again is hotheos, the God, God our Father. So in Romans 8 and verse 28, we read, we know that all, good, that all things work together for good to them who love God our Father, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And brethren, that includes you and me.